This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. And welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, since 1990, has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. As we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation, We'd like to encourage those of you who are not yet members and even those of you who are not yet vegetarians to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. Our members receive an informative newsletter as well as discounts at Down to Earth and many vegetarian friendly restaurants and may also be invited to participate in popular social events. And be sure to sign up for a membership before you leave tonight to start saving right away. Just think, if you spend only $8 a week on groceries or on eating out, a VSH membership will more than pay for itself. Before I proceed further, I'd like to mention that we have two special guests with us tonight, and I'd like them to stand up, Anne and Larry Wheat. They're the owners of the famous, the legendary Millennium Restaurant in San Francisco. So, yeah. <laughs> I see a number of you have either heard of it or have been there or have bought one of their cookbooks. I've been there. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So don't miss it if you go to San Francisco or if you're down anywhere, you know, in Silicon Valley or whatever. Just go up, drive up there. It's a really nice experience. Be sure to stay after our program, too, and sample some delicious vegan samples provided by the generosity of down-to-earth natural foods. We're videotaping tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Olelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and for this month on Thursdays at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website, vsh.org, to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Janice Stanger. Janice Stanger, PhD, is a nutrition expert, author, educator, and speaker. Her mission in writing The Perfect Formula Diet is to help people, animals, and the planet through providing solid yet little known information on whole foods, plant-based diets. She is in her 16th year of critically analyzing scientific studies on nutrition, weight loss, environmental toxins, and health. Janice has a PhD in human development and aging from the University of California, San Francisco, one of the country's leading health sciences campuses. She is certified in plant-based nutrition through the T. Colin Campbell Foundation and E. Cornell, and also has an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Stanger's presentation tonight is entitled, 10 Dangerous Nutritional Myths. Please welcome Dr. Janice Stanger. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. So what if the facts you take for granted about food, your long-standing beliefs about nutrients such as calcium and carbohydrates and protein, were actually wrong? We're going to look at 10 dangerous nutrition myths tonight, and we're going to look at what the real facts are. 
If you remember one thing and only one thing from this presentation tonight, please remember to question everything you hear about food. Remember to question all the popular notions that you'll see in the media, that you'll hear on television, that you'll see in run-of-the-mill books. You need to question everything. And why do you need to do this? It's because this misinformation is costing you. It's costing you a lot. Bad information about food is like bad information about stocks. It really has a price. And in the case of bad information about food, the cost can be years of wonderful life with your loved ones it can, that you can be deprived of. It can be lack of energy. It can be lack of your health. It can be money that you have to spend on medical care. It can be pain that you're enduring, and all of this totally unnecessary. So let's look at why there's so many myths out there. Okay, so this is a scene from one of my personal favorite fairy tales. I don't know if other people are familiar with this, but this is Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And this is when the little bear comes home and he's with his family and they find Goldilocks asleep in one of their beds. So why do we want to believe this? Because it's dramatic, it's fun, and in addition, it's comforting. We want to believe this. We want to believe that everything has a happy ending. In fairy tales, everything has a happy ending. Real life isn't like that, though. In real life, things happen that are not really what we want to have happen. In fact, what happens in real life can actually be scary. It can be sinister. And the thing about food myths is that they rob you of the chance to prepare, to prevent, to really make the most of your life. So you want to see what they are. And the thing about them is they don't have to act badly, they don't have to end badly, it's really up to you. So your choice makes a difference in how the story ends. You have the power. Once you find out what the myths are, you can do something about it, you can make different choices, and you can really turn your life around and your health around. It's really very simple. And this lady's gonna show us how simple it is. It's really all in your shopping cart, that's it. That's how simple it is, it begins and ends there. So let's start with myth one, which is one of the most fundamental myths that a lot of the others spring out of because a lot of these myths are kind of interrelated. And myth one is one of the most fundamental and the most dangerous, and that's the myth that if a little is good, more is better. We all know that food is necessary for us to even survive, right? We need calories, we need nutrients. And we want to make sure we get enough. That's, this is perfectly natural. Your body is very complex. Your body is this awesome, really intricate composition of 100 trillion cells. Think of that, 100 trillion cells. It's extremely complex, more so than the most finely tuned machine. And in order for it to function right with all the different organ systems and all these cells to work in harmony with each other, everything has to be at exactly the right level, the right amount. You don't want too much and you don't want too little. If you have too much, it overloads your body's waste disposal system. So let's think, for example, of the hot air balloon in this image. This is, now this hot air balloon isn't remotely as intricate as your body is, but it can still illustrate this principle. So imagine you're up in one of these balloons, you're far from the ground, and your health and welfare depends on this balloon coming safely to Earth at a controlled rate of speed. You don't want it obviously plummeting to Earth or orbiting away to outer space or getting out of control. So you want exactly the right amount of air in this balloon and you want it to be exactly the right temperature, right? What if you had somebody in there putting all this air into this balloon or overheating it? I mean, think about it, the balloon would not work. It would spring a leak or it might even explode because you're trying to overfill it past its ideal capacity. And this image really illustrates it. it and, and look carefully, because in a way, this is the most important image you're going to see tonight. You want to be right at the center of this circle. You want to be right on target. If you're too low at the bottom of the circle, right, you're nowhere near the target where you want to be. But if you're too high, which is too much, you're also nowhere near the target of what you want to be. When you get too much of a specific nutrient, then usually it interferes with the action of other nutrients. Your body, the ratio of one nutrient to another gets out of whack and your body just stops functioning properly. But there's also something else you need to keep in mind that can get you off balance. 
which are supplements for the most part. And there's a couple that are good I'll talk about later. But what most supplements do is they take isolated nutrients and they hyper-concentrate them and you end up with way too much. And that, as I said, just throws you out of balance. And that would include things like pills, protein powders, everything you take that would not be a whole food that you take because you think, oh, I want more, I want more, I want more. There's two exceptions I'll get into later, but most health studies find that supplements, which would be things like vitamins or minerals, I'm not talking about herbs here because herbs can be medicinal, but just things like protein powders, vitamins and isolated minerals and pills actually have no effect on your health or have a harmful effect on your health. So let's get on to the next myth, which also has to do with amounts. This is another very common myth. This is a myth of moderation. This is a myth that a little bit can't hurt. We all know this is not true with respect to cigarettes. We learned this quite a long time ago. Now we would hope food would not have that same effect, but unfortunately it does. When you continue to injure yourself with food that's not good, and let's say you were so moderate, I'm not saying you should never eat anything that's unhealthy, but let's say you only ate it once a week, you would be injuring yourself, what, 52 times a year. That's not trivial. So there's definitely consequences. Let's see how this injury happens. So there's two kinds of inflammation. Your body's response to any kind of danger is to protect you. Your body has very strong and very intricate systems to protect you from danger, whether that danger is a microbe, whether it's a physical injury, such as in this image where the person has a really bad scrape. It can be radiation, it can be a toxic chemical, it can be a parasite, it can be anything. Your body just immediately leaps into action. And the mechanism it uses to protect you is called acute inflammation. Now, in the usual course of events, this inflammation will protect you, it will resolve, the danger will be neutralized, so to speak, and your body will return to normal. You'll return to normal health. It won't continue indefinitely. The key players in this are your immune system and also to some extent your nervous system. But what happens if it's not deactivated? What happens? Well, it turns out that acute inflammation has an evil twin, and this is what makes you really sick. So the evil twin of acute inflammation is actually chronic inflammation, and this happens when your body never has a chance to heal. So this usually happens either when acute inflammation never really resolves the issue and doesn't get turned off, or when you're injuring yourself on a chronic basis every day, eating bad food, sometimes you're doing it three times a day. So your immune system, your inflammatory response is being triggered three times a day, 365 days a year, you can see it's never going to have a chance to resolve because it's constantly being turned on. And most chronic illnesses are actually manifestations in one way or another, in their own, each in their own unique way of chronic inflammation. And this includes a whole litany of disability, pain, and death. This includes cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, most headaches, sinusitis, allergies, Alzheimer's disease, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, gum disease, osteoporosis. The list just goes on and on and on of these diseases that are in some way or another manifestations of chronic inflammation. So you don't want this chronic inflammation. What this particular image shows is one of the most widespread or another in their own, each in their own unique way of chronic inflammation. And this includes a whole litany of disability, pain, and death. This includes cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, most headaches, sinusitis, allergies, Alzheimer's disease, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, gum disease, osteoporosis. The list just goes on and on and on of these diseases that are in some way or another manifestations of chronic inflammation. So you don't want this chronic inflammation. What this particular image shows is one of the most widespread and one of the most devastating examples of a chronic inflammatory process, and that is the plaque that will line your arteries. So most people have about 70,000 miles of blood vessels in their body, and what happens when you're constantly damaging them through a process of active inflammation is they become closed. They become lined with the substance called plaque.
Plaque is not passively deposited. Many people think it's just passively deposited, like grease under a kitchen sink. That's not true at all. It's actively formed through a process of chronic inflammation. And we'll see that a lot of this is triggered by animal foods as well as highly processed plant foods. So let's look at one of the triggers of chronic inflammation, and that is taking us to myth three, which is protein. And the myth is that you need a special source of protein in your diet. Even the USDA said that in their guidelines that were just released a few weeks ago. So most people think since they need the source of protein that they're going to get it from animal foods because everybody knows animal foods are high in protein. But the thing is that in nature, form follows function. So we all know that cats are meat eaters. I don't think anybody would ever argue that. Cats are natural meat eaters. And so nature has equipped them with these teeth. That's a form so that they can kill animals and eat them and get their meat. So the last time you looked in the mirror, did your teeth look like this kitty cats? OK. So if your teeth didn't look like these, this kitty cats, then you were not meant by nature to eat meat. You were not designed by nature to eat meat. And if anybody in here's teeth did look like this, then please leave the room, because seriously, you're scaring me. So where does this leave you in terms of getting protein? Well, we need to understand more about what protein is. There's two things in this picture. You may think you only see one, but we're going to identify two. And we're going to see which one has more protein. So the first is obviously the cow. What's the other thing that you see in this picture? Grass. OK, you see leafy greens. So calorie for calorie, it turns out that the leafy greens actually have more protein in them than the cow does, if you were to eat the cow. So let's see why. To understand why, you really need to see what protein is made out of what protein is all about. So protein is actually a gigantic molecule, and it's really a linked chain of smaller molecules called amino acids. And I just happen to have a protein chain here. So this is my protein chain. And the red links in this chain are what's called non-essential amino acids. And what that means is you really don't have to worry about them because your body's going to make them. You don't have to be concerned about them for one second, OK? Just trust yourself you're all right. The green ones are the essential amino acids, and you do need to get those from food. They're absolutely necessary. Well, it turns out that these 20 amino acids are the same in all living beings. And remember, living beings include both plants and animals. They're all made out of the same amino acids. They're put together different ways in different plants and different animals, and even in different people. So if you look at the person next to you, your proteins are different because your DNA is different from the person sitting right next to you. And unless you have an identical twin, your proteins are in some ways unique from that of every other person on the face of this planet. And in fact, nobody really knows how many proteins are in your body because it's still being studied, but it could be a number up to a million. So there's all kinds of different proteins that are made of these linked amino acids. Where do you get these essential amino acids? Well, it turns out they're actually made by plants. Now, why should that be? Well, I like to say that plants are Earth's nutrient factories and animals are nutrient consumers. And that's especially true in the case of protein and amino acids. Because remember, these amino acids have to be assembled from scratch, and that takes a lot of energy. Well, what living beings have that amount of energy? Animals don't have that amount of metabolic energy, but plants are solar powered. Plants have that amount of energy. They get their energy from the sun. So plants make these essential amino acids, and people get their essential amino acids either by eating plants, or they can eat animals that ate plants. Either one, you can get your essential amino acids. But basically, animal protein is nothing but recycled plant protein. So think about that. That's a really important point. Animal protein is recycled plant protein. Now, the whole thing about needing a source of protein is it's kind of a phony distraction because really 
all whole plant foods have amino acids in them and they have what you need because they were once alive. If you were to go out and eat a rock, sure, it's not going to have the essential amino acids in it because it was never alive. But the plant was alive. It's made of these essential amino acids. So it's like saying you need a special source of oxygen in your air. You don't. Oxygen is diffused throughout the room. And I could stand here if I were trying to sell you something, and I could say to you, you know, oxygen is not widespread throughout this room. Oxygen is concentrated in the southwest corner of this room. And if you don't dive into the southwest corner of this room, you're not going to have enough oxygen. And if I told you that enough times over and over and over and over, as many times as you heard about the protein, you'd probably believe me, and everybody would be fighting to get in that corner of the room. But it's just as silly to say you need a special source of protein because it's widespread in any living thing you can eat, whether it's plant or animals. So it's a pretty silly myth. But you might be saying to yourself, okay, maybe I don't need animal products for protein, but I need it to help regulate my insulin levels. So let's look at that myth. So myth four is that carbs raise insulin levels while protein lowers it. Okay, you've heard, probably heard this a million times, especially if you have diabetes or prediabetes. Your doctor has probably told you to obsess about carbs and just eat lots of protein and not really worry about it. But the actual truth is that proteins actually raise your insulin level. So let's look at this in a little more detail. The, the dynamic is very complex, and I don't have time to go into the whole thing tonight. But basically, whole plant foods, such as this whole grain here, and it could be a lot of different whole plant foods we're talking about, not processed foods. We're talking about whole plant foods as they kind of came out of the ground or have been only minimally processed. For example, this whole grain pasta, or it could be whole wheat bread, or it could be lots of other things, oatmeal, whatever will actually lower your fasting insulin level. And animal protein actually raises it for, anim for hours after a meal, as well as if you do eat sugar and you've been eating a lot of animal protein, it makes your body react way more strongly and way more forcefully to the sugar that you do eat. So if you have diabetes or prediabetes, or that's an issue for you or anyone you know, there's a book I very strongly recommend that will explain this in great detail. And that's by Dr. Neil Barnard, B-A-R-N-A-R-D. And he has a book out on reversing diabetes. You can find it on Amazon, and it will explain this whole dynamic to you. But it's very important. You could also actually find it in a medical textbook if you just want to read a medical textbook. I mean, it's kind of funny to me that doctors tell you this because any medical textbook will tell them otherwise. Let's move from insulin to another hormone, so let's move to the hormone called estrogen. And myth five is that soy is the source of most dietary estrogen. Okay, how many times have you heard this? I've probably heard it a thousand times when I go around and talk to people about food that they'll say, well, I can't eat soy. Soy is really unhealthy because it has all this plant estrogen in it. So let's look at where estrogen in food really comes from. We have a picture here of two very nice, beautiful beings. One is a beautiful dairy cow, and the other is a very nice field of soybeans. So the question is, which of these two beings has a reproductive process that's closer to humans? Does the cow have a reproductive process closer to humans, or does the soybeans? Anybody who thinks it's a cow, raise your hand. Anybody who thinks that soybeans are closer to people than the cow, raise your hand. Okay. So see, you guys don't need me. You can figure this out for yourself. This is just a big duh. As soon as you start thinking about it, you'll see what the truth is. Of course the cow is reproductively more like people. How could an animal be less reproductively like people than a plant is? I mean, plants reproduce, but not anywhere like animals do. So when you look at dairy cows, here's the thing. They only produce milk when they're pregnant or they've recently had a baby, actually when they've recently had a baby. So, so in order for them to keep producing milk, the dairy business people keep them constantly pregnant. And pregnant females of whatever species, whether it's cows or horses or people or whatever, have very high levels of estrogen. And in the case of the cows, because they're pregnant, at the same time they're producing milk from their last calf, 
their milk is very, very high in estrogen. And that is true not just of the milk, but anything that's made from it, whether it's cheese, yogurt, ice cream, whatever you're eating, it's just, just packed full, very densely of estrogen from this pregnant animal that's produced it. And cow's estrogen is virtually identical to human estrogen. So, you know, all the people I've ever met, I would say almost to a person who say, I won't eat soy because of its estrogenic effect, are sitting there talking to me and eating cheese which has 10,000 times the estrogenic activity that the soy has. Actually, the estrogen in soy is called phytoestrogen because it's a plant estrogen and its effect on humans is extremely weak. So let's see what research actually says about soy. The world's foremost expert on soy is Dr. Mark Messina. And he's recently published in 2010 an overview of 20 years of research. So this is published peer review research. This is not the kind of hearsay research you'll find on silly sites on the internet. This is research that's been published in peer reviewed medical and scientific journals on soy. And he looked closely at 20 years worth of studies. And he concluded that moderate amounts of soy foods in childhood and adolescence actually protect young females from developing breast cancer as adults. In adult women, it doesn't actually protect the same way it does as you had it when you were younger, but it's not harmful either. And that soy phytoestrogens are actually protective for men against prostate cancer. And in the case of men who do get prostate cancer, it makes it into a less aggressive form. He also found good evidence, although not as strong, that soy is protective against cardiovascular disease. So this is all published solid research. And he concludes that there's absolutely no credible evidence that moderate amounts of traditional soy foods are harmful in health. And by traditional soy foods, he's talking about things that are in this picture. Soy milk, soy yogurt, miso. It could also include edamame, tofu, tempeh any kind of traditional soy food. You know, we're not talking about the manufactured soy foods like isolated soy protein or soy oil. We're talking about traditional soy foods. Feel free to eat them once or twice a day. They're either going to help you or they're going to do nothing. They're not going to hurt you. If you want to fuel reproductive cancer, if you want this to grow inside your body, then make sure you eat lots of animal estrogens. And that will fuel your breast cancer, your uterine cancer, your prostate, your testicular, and your ovarian cancer. So while we're on the subject of cow's milk, let's look at another myth connected to cow's milk. And that's the myth that cow's milk is your best source of calcium. So how many times have you heard this? Probably every single week, OK? And particularly women are told that they have to drink lots of milk so they get enough calcium. And they're also often told to take calcium supplements. So let's look at the facts instead of the fairy tale. Here's the cycle of calcium in food. Calcium is not a living thing. Calcium is a mineral. It's part of the earth. It's basically like a rock. It has to dissolve to get into living things. So it gets hit by rain or whatever. It dissolves. It gets into the soil. And it turns out that calcium is absolutely necessary for plant metabolism. So plants need calcium as much as people do, and they have to absorb it through the roots. If you see a plant that's alive, that means that plant has calcium in it. Otherwise, it would be dead. So people think that they get calcium from cows because I think most people don't stop to think about it, but they think somehow the cows make calcium or they just don't think about it at all. But we all know cows don't make other minerals. We don't think cows make gold. We don't think they make silver. We don't think they make platinum. And calcium is a mineral the same as those other minerals. It is not something that cows make. It's something that gets into the cows because they ate leafy greens, which is your best source of calcium. And it got into their milk. And when you drink their milk, you're basically getting secondhand the calcium that was in any leafy greens they ate or any other plant foods they ate. Well, we're on the subject of calcium. Let's get on to another myth about calcium, which is that calcium is what makes your bones strong. So let's see what the real story is here on this one. What makes your bones strong? 
Now, the first thing about your bones is you want them to be durable. And what I mean by durable is you don't want them to break. You don't really care how thick your bones are. You don't care how hard your bones are. What you care about is that if you fall down or you sneeze or you cough or anything like that, your, your bone does not break. And what research has found is that calcium has little effect on fracture risk. And this is really not very surprising because, in fact, calcium is a very brittle mineral. And if you want to see an illustration of that, I just happened to have handy some calcium to show you. Let me get it out. We'll have a little demo here. Okay, so this is calcium. This is a piece of chalk. Chalk is almost pure calcium, okay? Obviously, it's, it's mixed with other elements, but the, um, the predominant thing in it is calcium, okay? So let's see how durable this chalk is. How, if this is how you want your bones to behave. So let's apply just a tiny amount of force to this chalk, right? It's extremely brittle. That's not how you want your bones to be. And in addition, too much calcium is toxic. It can cause kidney stones. It can also get deposited in plaque when you have too much of it. So remember, well, this gets back to our first myth, which is if a little is good, more is better. That was a myth. And that's very true of calcium, that if a little is good, more is not better when it comes to calcium. Because when you eat too much calcium, your body has to get rid of it. So it'll stash some in bones, what it can, and it'll excrete some, whatever it can. And then if it's left over with a bunch of calcium it can't use, it's going to start depositing in the plaque in your arteries. Well, what's it going to do to that plaque? It's going to make it brittle. That means your blood vessels, instead of being flexible, are going to be brittle and they're going to tear easily. That's not what you want for your blood vessels. In case you think this is just me and you're a little skeptical because you've probably never heard this before, I want to actually read you something word for word. And what I want to read you is the 2010, a very recent editorial in the British Medical Journal. And I can tell you the British Medical Journal is a peer-reviewed medical journal. Anybody here who's a doctor can attest to its pre being very prestigious. It's one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, in fact. And this is what they wrote. I'm going to read it to you. It says, bone mineral density, which is often used as a measure of treatment success, is a surrogate measure for real clinical benefit. So in other words, when you get your bone mineral density measured, which is what doctors measure to see if you have osteoporosis, it's really just a surrogate measure. It doesn't really tell you how strong your bones are. That's basically what they're saying. Then they go on to observe, calcium supplements given alone improve bone mineral density, but they are ineffective in reducing the risk of fractures and might even increase risk. They might increase the risk of cardiovascular events and they do not reduce mortality. They seem to be unnecessary in adults with an adequate diet. So again, this editorial, they're talking specifically about calcium supplements, but certainly the same holds when you're downing gobs of dairy, whether it's glasses of milk or cheese on everything or eating yogurt all the time or ice cream or whatever. It's the same principle. And just remember this, I can give you the reference if anybody wants it, just send me an email. So the thing about your bone walls, if you want to get your bones strong, the walls of your bones are actually not made of calcium. Your bone's made of little walls. It has kind of like a honeycomb structure. And what gives it its structural integrity are all these tiny little walls. And those are actually made out of a special kind of protein. And what you want to do is maintain the little walls because it's just like a house. When you have the walls, they're kind of like pillars and they give you a lot of structural integrity. When the little walls start breaking down, your bones become very porous and brittle. So one of the best ways to maintain the little walls is to actually get a lot of exercise because that stimulates the growth of your bones. And another way to do it is to eat a whole food plant-based diet, which actually helps the health of your bones quite a bit. So that's enough about calcium and minerals. Let's move on to fats, and specifically omega-3 fatty acids. Myth eight is that fish or fish oil is your best omega-3 source. Well, let's talk a little bit about omega-3 first. Has anyone in here, first off, not heard that they should be eating fish or fish oil? It's like the new snake oil. You know, you'd have to be hiding under a rock not to have heard this before. It's supposed to be good for everything. No matter what you name, somebody's going to say fish oil is good for it. Oops, I meant snake oil. Okay. 
Now, there is a grain of truth that you do need omega-3s in your diet. It is an essential fatty acid. There's two essential fatty acids. One is omega-3s, the other is omega-6s. They're related, as you can tell from, they're both omegas, but they're, they have slightly different molecular structures. All the other fats you hear about you actually don't need because your body can make them and you have absolutely no reason to have to eat them. But these two you do need to get from your food because your body can't make them and they're essential to your body structure and metabolism. So the reason that you're seeing a field of wild plants on this subject of omega-3s is that it turns out that our ancestors evolved eating wild plants, right? Long ago, people ate wild plants. And then they started to domesticate plants. Well, a funny thing happened when people started to domesticate plants. For some reason, the plants lost a lot of their omega-3s. So our ancestors evolved to eat a diet that was richer in omega-3s than the diet we eat, simply because we eat domesticated or farmed plants rather than eating uh, wild plants for the most part. What are we gonna do about that problem? What's the best solution? Well, the first thing I can tell you that the best solution is not to eat fish. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We'll just look at a couple tonight. The first thing you've probably already guessed by now, because remember I told you that plants are nutrient factories and animals are nutrient consumers, is that the fish actually don't make the omega-3s. They can't make the omega-3s any more than we can make the omega-3s. They get them from the wild plants they eat. So when you eat wild fish, these wild fish ate wild marine algae, or they ate other fish that ate the wild marine algae. Somewhere in the food chain, some fish ate the wild marine algae, and, and these omega-3s kind of worked their way up the food chain. The marine algae made the omega-3s. They also made the long-chain omega-3s. You might have heard there's short-chain and long-chain omega-3s. The marine algae made the long-chain omega-3s. They get in the fish, and then if you eat the fish, you get these long-chain omega-3s. But unfortunately, you get a lot of other things you don't want. And this is what comes from looking at just one nutrient and not the totality of what you're eating. For one thing, you're going to get mercury, and there's no way around that. And you don't want to get mercury. You're also going to get highly toxic chemicals called persistent organic pollutants that are especially concentrated in fish. In fact, 89 to 99% of the persistent organic pollutants in your body come from animal foods, and the dirtiest food in this regard is actually fish. Now you might be saying, okay, well, I eat purified fish oil supplements. I buy a brand that's very expensive, and it's been distilled, it's been purified, so my fish oil supplements don't actually have these pollutants in them. Well, guess what? A lab went around and bought a bunch of samples of these distilled fish foods, these distilled fish oils, took them to the lab, tested them, and guess what? They were still full of persistent organic pollutants. And again, this is published peer-reviewed research in a scientific journal. So even though the oil's been distilled and very heavily processed, it's still full of this. In addition, people think fish is a safe food and in fact, fish has significant cholesterol in it, which is going to help clog your arteries. So for all these reasons, fish is really not your ideal source of omega-3s. So what would be your ideal source of omega-3s? Okay, well, I'd love to tell you about this because we're getting to one of my favorite foods, one of my favorite plant foods, and this is ground flaxseed. Okay, probably you've heard a little bit about flaxseed because it is in the media a lot, but you might not have heard the whole thing. So I'm gonna give you some tips on flaxseed. First off, flaxseed is high in omega-3s. It's one of the foods that when it's domesticated did keep a lot of omega-3s for whatever reason, biologically speaking. If you wanna get these nutrients, really be sure to grind your flaxseed. The best thing to grind it in is a coffee grinder because the flaxseed has very hard hull and if you don't grind it, you're not going to be able to digest it or benefit from it. So if you're eating, for example, flaxseed crackers made from whole flaxseed, it's really not going to help you. After you grind it, refrigerate it, because once it's ground, it can go bad. Or if you don't want to go to all the work of grinding, you can buy it pre-ground in most health food stores. And then once it's ground, you want to eat about two tablespoons a day. It's very mild flavored, and you can put it on almost anything. You can put it on soups or salads, oatmeal, you can put it in smoothies, you can put it in cereal, you can put it on wraps, 
You can bake it in muffins. You can really do almost anything you want with it. In addition to having all these omega-3s, flax has a lot of other benefits. For one thing, it's very high in fiber, which helps keep your digestive system healthy. And it also has some other very beneficial phytochemicals. And what phytochemicals are is the phyto, you can probably guess from that word, is they're found only in plants. And one kind of phytochemical that's very high in flaxseed that's not found in a lot of other plants is called lignans. And lignans have been found to have very, very strong anti-tumor properties. So they're very good for fighting cancer. So there's a lot of reasons to eat flaxseed apart from the omega-3s. And you might have thinking, well, okay, that's great about flaxseed, but I heard somewhere, I read somewhere on the internet or somebody trying to sell me fish oil for all this high cost, is that the flaxseed only has short-chain omega-3s and I need the long-chain omega-3s. Well, again, think about your ancestors roaming around. What did they do before they could go to the store and buy fish oil supplements? Obviously, they lived for thousands of years long enough to reproduce. They grew to reproductive age. They were healthy enough to have babies, and they live long enough to raise their babies. So they were getting enough omega-3s. Their bodies formed the long-chain omega-3s, and so will yours, because you have the same genetic heritage. There was a recent study done in Europe of over 14,000 people, and it looked at people on different diets. And it's a wonder nobody thought to do this before. It was only very recently published, but it's one of those like, duh, studies like, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? And they looked at the level of long-chain omega-3s that was actually circulating in the blood of people on different kind of diets, and relative to the amount that they ate. And when they compared fish eaters with people who were vegan, that is, ate 100% plant-based diet, they found, of course, the vegans ate virtually no long-chain fatty acids, and the fish eaters ate a lot, but when you looked at the levels in their blood, they were virtually identical. So the people who were eating a plant-based diet were making their own long-chain omega-3s. It's, again, it's nothing you have to worry about. Somebody's trying to sell you something expensive. Another great thing about flaxseed is it's very inexpensive. I buy flaxseed in San Diego, organic whole flaxseed that I grind myself for about $2 a pound, which will comfortably last a month. So it costs me about $2 a month. I check down to earth, it's about $2.59. So you pay $0.59 cent premium for Hawaii, OK? It's less than another 10 bucks a year. It's worth it, believe me. Nobody's getting rich off this $2.59. Even down to earth is not getting rich off it. But they're going to get plenty rich not down to earth because they don't sell fish, but other stores are selling you this fish oil. So, you know, just follow the money and you don't have to spend all this money. You can be way healthier and spend a lot less money. So while we're on the subject of fish, let's look at another fishy myth, which is myth nine, that growing animal foods makes them healthy. And again, you'll hear this all over. And here's how it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is that you're not supposed to eat high-fat foods. Everybody knows that. So people think if you grill animal foods over an open grill, and, the, and people think this is especially true for fish and chicken because they think they're healthier to begin with, that the fat drips into the fire, you lose more of the fat, you're left with the lower fat product, and therefore it's healthier, right? And anybody's ever heard this? Of course, everybody's heard this. But this is only a very small part of what happens when you grill. Let's see the, the bigger picture of what happens when you grill. Now, here's a conclusion you can read about from the US government, from the Food and Drug Administration. It's not just me telling you this. Grilling produces carcinogens. It produces several kinds of carcinogens. Uh, let's talk first about the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. This is a class of very toxic chemicals that are formed when there's an incomplete combustion of carbon-containing food, carbon-containing anything. In this case, we're talking about food, but it could also be the charcoal as well, or wood, or whatever you're burning. It's not going to completely combust, and therefore you're going to get some PAHs. There's over 100 different kinds. They're all very bad for you. And in addition to being carcinogenic, they damage your DNA. There's other issues with them. 
Credible studies, and again we're talking about peer-reviewed studies in medical journals, have shown that when pregnant women are exposed to PAHs, that the IQ of their babies are permanently and irreversibly lowered to the point where it's measurable in their schoolwork. So if you're pregnant, stay away from grilled foods and stay away from even the smoke because the smoke has these carcinogens in them and they'll get into your body in two ways. One is by eating and the other is by smelling the smoke. And even if you're not pregnant, it's going to damage many parts of your body. For example, it can damage your lungs, it can damage your eyes, it can damage your skin, it can damage your red blood cells. That's only the beginning. So you don't want to be exposed to these chemicals at all. The, the optimal dose is zero. So these PAHs that form when the smoke, when the fat drifts on the fire and, and starts to burn but doesn't completely burn and then drifts back up as smoke, is way more dangerous than the fat ever was. Now, there's other chemicals that form as well. It's not just PAHs. Just to give you one other example, heterocyclic amines form, and you might have heard of these as well. And these are also carcinogens that uh, damage your DNA. So growing foods is very dangerous, and if you're going to eat animal foods at all, which hopefully you won't, uh, the bottom line is don't grill them. So the last myth I want to get, go into kind of grades into what you should eat, and this is a big myth that, again, probably everybody in here ho hears multiple times a week, which is we have to obsess about what our food's made out of. We have to dissect our food, right? You worry about proteins, you worry about carbs, you worry about fat. In addition, you're gonna worry about calcium and zinc and iron and you think I have to eat this for this nutrient and this for that nutrient and this for that nutrient. Before you know it, you've eaten so much food that you've gained a bunch of weight. None of it's whole food because you're just eating each, you know, food for each little thing it can get. Well, in fact, when you're eating whole plant foods, you don't, need to di you don't need to dissect them. You don't need to worry about all this. You don't need to stress about all this. What's the optimal amount of protein in your diet? It's the amount you get from eating whole plant foods. Whatever it is, you're going to get the right amount because nature knows the right proportions. You don't have to worry about it. So it frees you from all this worry. Wow, you can just relax. You can enjoy your food. It's just so much better because these whole foods are just a superstar team of actually thousands of nutrients. We don't even know what most of them are. I mean, the science of nutrition is really in its infancy. There's thousands of phytochemicals that really haven't even been discovered or studied yet. So the best thing to do is to eat whole plant foods and you're going to get the right proportions. So let's look at what your alternatives are. You have three choices for food every time you go to the grocery store. You go to the grocery store and Unless you're in down to earth, you can buy animal foods. Or actually, even down to earth, I guess you can buy them because you can buy dairy foods. And animal foods are basically the muscles, the organs, the secretions, and the reproductive materials of animals. So we know what those are, right? You can buy manufactured foods, and the supermarkets make lots of money selling you that. And there's endless numbers of those. There's thousands of numbers of different kinds of manufactured foods. That would include, for example, most people would know sodas, energy drinks, protein powders, manufactured oils, even olive oil, but any kind of manufactured oil that's in a, a bottle. It includes margarine, it includes white rice, it includes white bread, it includes processed sugars, it includes things made from that, like commercial cookies, commercial crackers, commercial pretzels. Pretty much 90% of what the supermarket sells is going to fall in the category of manufactured foods because it's a very high profit margin. And finally, you can eat perfect foods. And what are perfect foods? That's what I call any kind of whole plant food or things you can easily make from whole plant foods. So you don't have to just eat like raw lettuce or raw carrots. And we're going to go a little more what you can eat. We're talking here about things you can easily make in your kitchen. So, for example, soybeans are a whole food, right? But you don't have to just eat edamame. You can also make them into tofu. You can make them into tempeh. You can make them into soy milk. Those are all things that if you wanted to, you could make in your own kitchen. You might not choose to do it, but you could if you wanted to. But you could not make soy oil in your kitchen. It has to be made in a factory. You could not make isolated soy protein in your kitchen. It has to be made in a factory. So at that point, you're kind of grading into the manufactured foods. So you're probably not used to living on a diet of perfect foods. So you might be saying to yourself, well, 
that's fine, but what am I actually going to eat? So let's look at that. So I want to tell you first off that there's a lot of whole food plant-based diets out there and undoubtedly some other speakers you've had here have given you insights into some that are very good. There's not just one diet, there's multiple diets that could be good. The one I'm going to tell you about specifically tonight I call the perfect formula diet, but it's not the only one. I just want to encourage you to eat whole plant foods Look at this as one alternative. If it works for you, that's great. If not, try another one. So in this diet, there's basically four pillars of different kind of whole plant foods that you're going to eat either alone or in combination that are going to form the bulk of what you eat. So by volume here, by volume, I'm talking about, for example, like a measuring cup or whatever, one quarter are going to be vegetables, one quarter are going to be fruit, one quarter are going to be whole grains, and one quarter are going to be any mixture in any proportion of potatoes and legumes. By legumes, we, it's basically beans and peas and things like that, lentils, that kind of thing. Whole grains include things like, obviously, wheat berries, but also whole wheat pasta, whole wheat bread. It can include corn. It can include quinoa, millet, oatmeal, rye. There's all kinds of tasty whole grains that you can have. Brown rice is a really good one. So you say, well, how much should I eat? Well, the answer is your body. Remember, we talked about how intricate your body is with 100 trillion cells. In order to keep itself on track, your body has sensors. So your body knows what you're eating. You can't fool your body. You may have artificial sweeteners, which is another manufactured food or whatever you want. But the fact is your body knows exactly what you're eating. And so when you get enough nutrients and enough calories, your body's going to say, okay, had enough to eat, go do something else. It's going to turn your appetite off and you're, not, you're going to lose interest in food. When your body says you've had enough to eat, you're going to eat when you're moderately hungry. Don't wait till you're famished because if you're famished, you're probably going to eat too much, too fast, and you're going to be grabbing a lot of things that aren't good for you. So wait until you're hungry to eat, but don't wait until you're famished, just a little to moderately hungry. And then stop when you're full. So you might eat, if you were to eat four cups a day, one cup would be whole grains, one cup would be potatoes and or legumes, one cup would be fruit, one cup would be vegetables. If you were to eat eight cups of food a day, because that's the amount your body said you needed, you would double those amounts, but you would keep the proportions. And you don't have to be really precise about this thing. You don't have to get out a measuring cup and start measuring things. You just want to kind of make sure you're eating generously of each of these kinds of foods. If you're eating generously of each of these kind of foods, you're doing okay. Don't worry about eating them in any particular order. And if there's an afternoon and it's hot and you just want to eat some nice cold fresh fruit and that's what you want to eat all afternoon, that's fine. Just make sure later in the evening you eat something else or maybe even the next day, okay? So eat flavorful foods. And when I say flavorful, I don't necessarily mean really spicy. It doesn't have to burn your tongue. You just want it to have a good flavor. And use whatever herbs and spices you like. They can be fresh. They can be dried. Just whatever tastes good to you. And another good thing about doing this is you're not going to need as much salt because things taste so good because you put on all this cilantro or parsley or garlic or ginger or, you know, whatever you use it, you're not really going to need a lot of salt. The other thing you can eat, and this isn't required, but a lot of people like it, is some nuts. You don't want to eat huge amounts of nuts because they actually have a very high caloric density. But if you want to eat one or two handfuls of nuts a few times a week, four or six times a week, that's fine. Uh, nuts in that quantity have been shown to be beneficial to your health. Uh, they add some interest to your diet. They give you different recipe abilities. If you're using nuts, you can make, for example, peanut sauce or have a peanut butter sandwich or an almond butter sandwich, or put almond butter in your smoothie. So it gives you different things you can do, and it'll just help keep you more interested in your diet and keep you on track with your diet. And finally, there's a few more simple additions on this diet to these six whole food categories. One is ground flaxseed. We already talked about that. Your two tablespoons a day of ground flaxseed. Vitamin B12, this is an important one. You want to get that enough of that because if you don't, it can cause permanent neurological damage. Well, here's the thing about vitamin B12. It's one of only two vitamins that are not made by plants. Every other vitamin is made by plants. Or if it's a mineral, it's absorbed from the ground by plants. Or if it's a protein, it's metabolized using solar energy by plants. But B12 is actually made by microbes, not by plants. 
So again, think back to your ancestors. They were running around, they were foraging wild food, and they found all kind of yummy wild food they could eat. And they also drank water from lakes and streams. Well, the water was not chlorinated, so the water had bacteria growing in it, therefore the water had B12. They picked up a piece of fruit from the ground. It wasn't sterilized, it had B12 was on this fruit. So pretty much they were getting a lot of B12 every day, just naturally in the course of their lives. Well, what do we do today? We eat sterilized food and we drink sterilized water, right? Our water's all chlorinated. It's not gonna have the B12. I don't advise you to drink unsterile water because you don't know what else is gonna be in it. The same with food. If you ate unsterile food, you would get some B12, yeah, but you might also get E. coli. So I'm not recommending that. I'm recommending you take a B12 supplement. And some people try to short changes by saying, I'll eat this food or that food or this enriched food or that enriched food. You know, don't take a chance, it's not worth it. The B12, it's extremely inexpensive. It's not a big deal to take it. Don't play games with your health, just go out, buy a good vegan B12 supplement and just take it as directed on the bottle and you don't have to worry about it. Then vitamin D is the other vitamin that's not made by plants and that's actually made by the sun on your skin. And again, to see how these things work, you always have to think back in history, like how were things before they were today, because they've only been the way they were today for a very short time, like the last century, right? Before that, everything was different, how people lived and what they ate and everything else. So people were outside all the time because they were foraging for food. They were out in the sun, the sun was making vitamin D, there was never an issue. Well, nowadays we're not out in the sun very much, so we don't get vitamin D. Some people are loath to go out in the sun. If for any reason you're loath to go out in the sun, you don't want to go out in the sun, uh, you want to study more about this, that's fine, learn more about vitamin D. In that case, you can take supplements. But the best thing to do is just let your skin manufacture the amount it needs by going in the sun. And certainly here in Hawaii, that should not be a problem. But remember, happy endings can still happen. It's your choice. So if you want to take one step, however large or however small, at your discretion in the direction of a whole food plant-based diet, that's the best thing you can do for yourself. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Janice Stanger for uh, giving us a really great and informative talk that tore down some really popular but dangerous myths and giving us instead some great research-based information that will help us achieve a lot better health based on a whole foods, plant-based diet. So thank you again for coming and have a safe return home. Good night. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.